Welcome to the Urban Complex, a system of interrelated emotion charge ideas, feelings, memories, and impulses. This name takes the definition and lays out what a listener should expect. A podcast where ideas, feelings, and memories collide, leading towards meaningful change. I'm co host Chris Richardson. Please enjoy the journey with the Urban Complex. Smarter cities for a stronger tomorrow. Welcome to the Urban Complex. All opinions by Chris Richardson, Dominic Papa, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Arizona State University or Amazon Web Services. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for any decisions. Any endorsement of or messages from sponsors are solely supporting the production of this podcast. There is no further relationship with the podcast purposes and the sponsors unless separately created with another entity. Enjoy the Urban Complex. Smarter cities for a stronger tomorrow. All right, Dom, it's that time again. What's going hey, Chris. on? Chris? Yeah, I mean, you know, we've talked about sports a lot on the show, and so <laughs> it doesn't get much bigger than the Super Bowl. Uh, and what a game it was, man. Um, Tur- just yeah, Rams and Bengals. Like, oh, <laughs> my goodness. It had me on the edge of my seat the whole – the entire game. And so I, it just doesn't get better than that. I mean, for anyone that's just a sports fan in general, um, it, was, it was a great game to watch. Uh, both teams played their hearts out and, you know, yeah, let's, um, let's hope when it's back here in Arizona, we don't have a blowout. Uh, that was a great game. Yep, that, that was a great game, and it was good to see someone from our division win it. So uh, hopefully that can be the Cardinals next year, maybe. Fingers crossed. Uh, what did you say, Seahawks? Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, so uh, is it, is it, speaking of L.A. and the Super Bowl uh, in L.A., isn't our guest from L.A.? Yeah, she is. Uh, We have uh, Clara Mordecai coming on. Really interesting executive. She's CEO and co-founder of a company called ePave. I'm really excited to hear this story, kind of a way to bring a new way to preserve asphalt and cut down environmental toxins. So it's really exciting. Yeah, it's going to be exciting to hear. I mean, if there's one place that needs it, it's (laughs) It's it's Arizona Arizona with our heat. So uh, (laughs) You're covered in pavement. (laughs) Yeah, really, really excited to see what she has to say. Shall we bring her in? Let's do it. Awesome. Here we go. Support for this episode of The Urban Complex comes from Worldwide Technology. What if we could connect people to new possibilities, turn thinking into a way forward, solve problems before they become a problem, and share the future with everyone? We can. At WWT, we connect businesses to technology to make the impossible possible, to reach better decisions faster, to accelerate progress. Together, let's make a new world happen. Hi, Clara. Please let Dom and I give you a warm welcome to our podcast, Urban Complex. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it was exciting. Uh, We we found the best way to build rapport with our listeners is just to learn about you. And uh, so, yeah, just tell us a little bit of information, who you are, what do you want the podcast to know about you as a person? Yes, thank you. Um, So I moved to the United States from Iran in 1991 to go to college. Um, I always thought I would be a journalist, but obviously life had a different plan for me. So um, I already had some advanced training in applied mathematics. So I decided to study computer engineering and science at University of Southern California. If you ask me why I chose engineering, I would say that I always have been drawn to anything that seemed like a challenge. Mm -hmm. I'm glad life directed me to that, since without the STEM background, uh, I wouldn't be able to do what I do now. So earlier in my career, I worked in technology, in different industries, and as my horizon got bigger, I always knew that I wanted to make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. I had a vision to do something larger than myself, and I always wanted to give back. Uh, This is something that I had learned from my parents. That's awesome. Uh, That's that's exciting. I love when people have that passion to to go out and make positive change. And so we're really excited to hear more about kind of what you're working on. But before we do, before we jump into, um, you know, specifics around ePay, let's talk a little bit about Smart Cities. This is a podcast around, you know, smarter cities for a stronger tomorrow. We've had a lot of fun asking our guests what their <laughs> perspectives are on smart cities because we know everyone has different views and opinions about smart cities, but we would love to just hear about, uh, you know, what, what's your view on smart cities and, and what's working, what's not working, and, and how are you interacting with them? Sure, sure. Um, so for me, uh, smart city is person-centric. 
is, is, is built around health and well-being of their residents. What falls under that is the food we eat, the air we breathe, and the physical environment in which we live and work. Uh, mm -hmm. What's working right now is the spe specifically after the pandemic, there is a lot of focus on physical, mental, and emotional well-being. Mm -hmm. And also what works is improving our environment, uh, creating more livable cities that include affordable housing, workspaces, and also recreational spaces that are close to one another. Now, what's not working is that we're still sitting in traffic on crumbling infrastructure, breeding dirty air, and battling the impacts of rising heat and also destroying our natural resources. So these issues are very important to me and played a big role helping me decide on the type of business opportunity that I would like to pursue. That's awesome. That's a perfect segue into ePave. So tell what should our audience know about, you know, kind of ePave and tell us the story of how, you know, you and the founding team saw the opportunity and any key events necessary to really uh, get us started on the conversation. Sure, sure. So um, my brother, who's also co-founder of ePave, was traveling in Armenia. He ended up in a village that had no main roads to the city since uh, the road was uh, destroyed during a harsh winter. So the villagers didn't have any access to food or hospital or life necessities. Mm -hmm. And he knew that one of the main reasons that for poor roads were A, lack of governmental funding and B, pavement products that don't last long. So he started kind of doing his own research to find out if there were any other products in the market that would, would have a longer life lifespan and longer lasting that we currently have, which is asphalt, and also could withstand harsh climates. He met the inventor online, believe it or not, and uh, the inventor of eBay, and the rest is history. So when he asked me to launch... It was that easy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> that easy. It only took a few months of research, but that was... <laughs> so when he asked me to launch the venture... With him, I said, absolutely not. <laughs> I was hesitant at first because I was thinking he's probably out of his mind. Because <laughs> roads are a huge undertaking. But I mean, imagine you start with that mindset. But then when uh, he kept coming back, he kept asking, he kept asking. But then I started kind of looking into the product and see if this is something viable. And when I saw the benefits, especially when, when I saw the non-toxic aspect of this product, I knew I was in trouble. So I call it love at first sight. But <laughs> so, but what, what was important to me and address some of the things that are, I cared about, which was non-toxic aspect, is um, when uh, that, that was actually what draw, drew me to this product. Mm -hmm. But what we did was we started kind of doing some additional testing to see if this is going to really work in the real world. But we realized that this product was also reflective mm. and it lowered the heat signature. So basically what we did, we bought the patent, we incorporated the company and did all the necessary testing to bring it to market. So throughout this whole process, we heavily had support from uh, some of the programs they went through. So which I will talk to you more about them, but pretty much we needed support. We went through USC, Synchrotron Accelerator Program. We went through National Science Foundation Innovation Core, uh, which is called i -Core Program. We went through US Green Building Council Net Zero Accelerator Program. We also went through Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator Program, which we're currently a portfolio company. All those key things that we did to get this ball rolling. And every single one of these groups that I mentioned have given us support to continue on this path. So we could say I am living a mini American story, starting at the ground floor in our garage with a network of amazing people who came to believe in us and in the product and our vision. Awesome. Give, give some context. How, how big is the company? Like how many do, do, you, do you look at success as like deployments of asphalt with this new, new asphalt? Like what, what is, how, how big is it? How many employees? So, so the, the company is very small. Um, there are currently five of us, uh, but we also have many consultants. So the, the team of five core people that are always working on it, but then 
Um, everything else is um, outsourced, like pro the production is outsourced, the application is outsourced, and also we have consultants that we bring on board when we need, for example, quality assurance, and um, if, if we need, uh, for example, to advance certain areas of the technology, but the core team is five people. Oh, wow. Well, so we in Arizona know a thing or two about hot pavement. Uh, they say we can, during our summers, we can fry eggs out here. But uh, yeah, tell us, so what, what is pavement cooling? Uh, your product's pavement cooling product. Tell us how you change the game. I and mean, we've got a little bit of the story there, but, and then also make sure to explain what a heat or, or urban heat island is for our guests. Sure, sure. But let me start with the heat, uh, urban heat island, because that's probably will explain what is it that we do. So what we call urban heat island occurs when cities start replacing the natural land and greenery with dense concentration of pavement, buildings, and other resources, other surfaces that actually starts absorbing and retaining heat. This effect increases the energy cost. Mm. Uh, air conditioning, of course. It also um, pollutes the air and increases the air pollution, and it also affects the heat-related illnesses and even death. So um, 90, it just blew my mind away when I found out that 90% of those pavements were asphalt. And oh. asphalt deteriorates very fast because it goes through an oxidation process and it just deteriorates from sun, UV and also from rain. And, um, and then when it deteriorates every few years, they have to reapply and do some kind of a maintenance uh, program. And the, the asphalt also releases toxic and also greenhouse gas emission that further exacerbates the urban heat island effect. So what is it that ePave does? ePave is a cool pavement technology. It's a reflective pavement preservation coating, mouthful, right? Okay. It preserves the underlying surface, when you put it on asphalt, it preserves the underlying asphalt. It decreases the heat on the surface of the pavement and the ambient air, and therefore it decreases the urban heat island. So I would say the impact that where ePave makes is threefold. Number, number one is economic impact. Number two is environmental impact. And number three is human impact. Environmental impact, uh, unlike any petroleum-based products, ePave lasts twice as long, meaning fewer repairs and lower maintenance costs. No. Environmental impact, it finds climate change effects. It lowers surface and, uh, uh, and ambient air temperatures. It also qualifies a project for LEED certification. Mm. On the human impact, it reduces heat-related effects and illnesses and also eliminates toxic emissions. So if you're anywhere close to asphalt, when they pour asphalt, you can, you can also smell how toxic that is. And also, as I said, it needs maintenance every few years. So, so, so why wouldn't someone use it? Like, it seems like a no-brainer. Yes, exactly. Why is, it, <laughs> why is it a game changer? So for, the, for, for this question, I was thinking about why is ePave a game changer? And I'm thinking to myself, let's imagine we're in a, we have a town where all the asphalt is covered with ePave, right? It reduces emission, it mm. cleans the air, and in the process, it lowers the heat signature. So every road in this town is protected by ePave that's sustainable, stronger, and most important, no potholes and needs maintenance maybe every 10 to 12 years. So um, on top of all that, ePave enhances the beauty and urban environment, and it has a wide range of colors that can be used. So why not, right? Yep. That's awesome. <laughs> so, what, what, so what's on the horizon? Like, what are the big challenges? I mean, I'm sure starting a business is not easy, but like, tell us big goals <laughs> yeah, what, and how you solve them. So challenges... A lot, but we're <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a daily and sometimes it's mighty hard. team of five. What do you got? <laughs> <laughs> you, you can you you can imagine that. So uh, what we're what the challenges are currently? We have been in beta testing mode and we have done twelve projects. We have covered almost two hundred thousand square feet uh, square oh, foot wow. of, uh, different areas locations that varies from roads to parking lots to schools. What we have learned through this process that we need additional field testing for heavy load traffic. And I'm talking mm -hmm. about trucks and uh, to make it durable. We know it lasts under heavy load traffic, but how long is something that we need to find out. 
Additional testing we need to do for uh, pigments and color varieties because we come in different colors from gray all the way to blue, green, yellow, and uh, black. And uh, we also have received a lot of feedback from customers that we are uh, we engage uh, and then also we were working on that. But we also found out through uh, the study that we did through the National Science Foundation that there's a huge appetite for black reflective coding. Now, yeah. that will be a game changer because there's no such thing yet. So in order for us to accomplish all this and scale production and increase sales, we are working on bringing investors who truly care about making an impact with ePay. So I would say we're looking for impact-driven investors. Awesome. We're also <laughs> looking uh, for big projects to expand ePay's reach and benefits to the community, uh, continue to monitor and refine the product to meet customer needs. So imagine if we could do all this with more projects to learn more about ePay, well, what else we can do with this product? That's awesome. I, it sounds like a tremendous pr uh, product and we're excited to kind of watch your journey um, <laughs> over the next year and even, even further into the future. Uh, so, so that's great. It really sounds like a game changer. And especially as Chris mentioned, <laughs> for places like Arizona, uh, where we could massively use it. Um, let's, go, let's go back to smart cities. Though for a second, um, any thoughts on Los Angeles as a smart city? Anything you've seen them doing that kind of gives you inspiration? Oh, absolutely. Uh, they are looking into using cool pavement products. Uh, they are also looking to expand EV charging infrastructure. Also, they're working on greening a lot of underserved communities that we, we also have put some of our product in underserved communities. So I know that the uh, city of Los Angeles is looking into that. Uh, Los Angeles Clinic Incubator, where I mentioned where to incubate it at, they work closely with city of Los Angeles. And I know for a fact that they are a big participant in building a green economy, which gives all of us hope. That's awesome. Yeah, they're, we definitely keep our eyes on LA. They, they always seem to be doing something quite innovative. And, you know, actually, too, the, the city of Phoenix just hired its first ever urban heat island director. Uh, it was a professor wow. at Arizona State University. So we'll have to maybe put you in contact with him yeah, because great. it's one of the, I think, first departments of its kind kind of in I've the country. So it's, it. Yeah, it's, it's great. So that it has a, you know, a, its own department now. Uh, to try to start to mitigate the, the effects of the urban heat island here. So we'll definitely, it just reminded me, we'll put you in touch with them and maybe there's an opportunity here uh, in Phoenix. The other one that jumps to mind, uh, Dom, is I hear uh, maybe uh, Kamal in Michigan, if you need massive space to test, like they've got this entire, one of our episodes, uh, she was talking about Ann Arbor Spark and this ecosystem they've built. Um, so I, I don't know where, where you'll get the space, but I don't know if that's something that fits in there. But between the two, I think there's some good introductions. Oh, absolutely. We would love to. I think the more uh, areas we cover, the better it is. And as you know, I mean, the more we, we're learning more about the product every day. And I think we're also looking at the customers to give us feedback. What is it that they need? And we can, so we can't, we can't do this. I think we've done enough with this core team to bring a product that market to market that works. I think the rest of it is, takes a community, takes a village. We have to do it together. Yeah, the project, yep. the better it is for us. Definitely, collaboration is key, right? Uh, that's great. So, you, you know, a lot of our guests representing cities have had some major success um, with incubators to help generate new ideas. You've already kind of mentioned uh, it sounds like a handful of them that ePave yeah. has gone through, uh, but we noticed one. I think it's the LA twenty twenty at Net Zero Accelerator. Do you mind talking to us uh, and sharing a little bit about your experience in there and how how has it helped you as a company? kind of mature over the years. Absolutely. So um, I believe that every new innovative technology relies on early adopters uh, to get us through the initial phases. And when we joined USGBC Net Zero Accelerator, they made all the necessary introductions to cool. potential significant customers, like for example, Gower Studios and URW Westfield. And also they provided mentorship and, mm -hmm. and continued guidance after we graduated, I mean, we graduated last year, 2020, but um, actually 2020, I mean, we're 2022 hall. Uh, so- um, That's so fine. Oh my God, I know. <laughs> and uh, so uh, 
they, they, they continue. I was, I was on the phone with them last week and they kept saying, so if you need more introductions or whatever we need. So this type of, this type of community, being in a community of like-minded people and um, green entrepreneurs has helped support us to get us to the uh, other level. So what I would say, and I could also include again, Lacey in that because they also provide us with mentorship and guidance and uh, genuine caring. So I would say this accelerator and incubator programs mean what they preach and they're extremely helpful to us. So it's great to hear. We have a lot of uh, entrepreneurs that have been on the show and it's just interesting how different ways to work with their, you know, um, so a few ways that even on your LinkedIn, you kind of represent yourself as a, a green entrepreneur. Um, tell us a little bit about what, what you see as a green entrepreneur. And as you you said, you were raising some funding, um, you know, there's ways tech entrepreneurs have been branded. Any differences you see in how the market looks at you differently or, or how you consider yourself different? So for me, the term green entrepreneurship is the combination of being an entrepreneur, but with more focus on the environment. So what, what green entrepreneurs do, they bring to market a green products like ours, like ePave, to market. They um, it, it enhance demand for them and also build green jobs. They have environmental concerns and challenges to, to, to deal with, such as global warming, pollution, climate change, a scarcity of natural resources, other disasters that caused by destruction and, uh, of the ecosystem. And when you talk about tech entrepreneurs, they're mostly focused on building businesses that is powered by technology and innovation that aims to solve customer problems. So I, I would think that I think that many green entrepreneurs are also tech entrepreneurs because we're working on uh, the technology aspect of the technology uh, uh, of, of a product too. So those are the, so basically a green, I would call this a green, uh, I would call myself a green tech entrepreneur because uh, I think we're working on both. Of right. Them. You've got great IP and you've got the patent. Now it's just figuring out how to get the scale, which I think is what probably the tech entrepreneurs do, which, you know, it's with software. It's just in, in exactly. I, I think, I think when you look at that landscape, for them, it kind of seems easier. I don't think it is easier, but when you look at a hardware, basically this is a hardware, this is a product that you yeah. take to market. So whoever you talk to, they always say, oh, software is much easier because it's not as capital intensive because then you look at the uh, a product that becomes even harder for them. But the way I look at it is this is necessity and this is challenging, but it's a f- exciting challenge to have. Mm-hmm. So Boy. yes. And I, and I think the branding as being green also helps with the customer base. Then automatically customers start thinking about the sustainability aspect of it and how, how they would like to be part of this, part of building a green economy. So. That makes a lot of sense. We, we, we do have two standard questions we, we do before we wrap up. You kind of were alluding earlier with, with your, your scenario where everything was using your product. So um, but our question is just what can we do to help um, get more, more of what you're trying to accomplish. And what, if someone's listening, what would you want them to do? Uh, if there was something we could open doors, I know Dom had, had, a, had a great uh, example. Um, we had another guest here. So just, yeah, tell us about what, what we can do to help ePave and, and your journey. Thank you. What you just said about Kamal, uh, community building. So being on shows like this, if people are want to reach out to us and uh, work with us, we would love that. So what we're looking for right now are customers early adopters yeah. who need pavement maintenance and they're willing to use a new technology that saves them money on the long run and also improves the health and the environment. We're also looking for investors, as I mentioned, we're seeking opportunities to really, uh, investors who are looking for opportunities to make a difference. And um, they, they are interested in building smart cities. So. Uh, you saw me refer to impact investors earlier. So impact investors are important because they could help us with this working model that we have built and then help us kind of go to broader applications and maybe seamless um, uh, production and scalable business. So I would say customers and investors are what we're looking for right now. And, and what, who, who's and typically the customer? 
So the customer can be anyone. You have a parking lot. You're a customer. You, um, gotcha. uh, I mean, eventually we'll get to driveways, but for now we're just kind of trying to focus on parking lots and uh, schools. Um, you have schoolyards. You have um, municipalities. We're working with also municipalities. Next week we have a, a project with City of Glendale. We're doing a parking lot for them before we transfer into roads, but. For County of LA, for example, we did few roads. So anywhere you look, uh, 45% Great. of urban areas are roads and covered areas. Imagine the market for that. Imagine. Well, one, one, of our, one of our ex-guests, uh, Ron Gonan with Closed Loop Partners uh, might be one. He, uh, he, he invests in circular economy, so might be one to check out. We can make an introduction there. All right. Uh, and as you wrap up, is there anyone you want to um, make a note of, of thanks to, someone that's particular, you're particularly appreciative of the work they've helped? We know, you know, you can't do this stuff on your uh, on its own. And uh, and of course, selfishly, if you think they might be a good guest on the urban uh, complex, we'd love to hear. Yes. I mean, I was I was thinking about this uh, question earlier. So first, first off, there are many people who deserve to be recognized on our, in our journey. But the time is format of the podcast doesn't allow me to find <laughs> information. It's just like an Oscar speech. I mean, yeah, exactly. First, I would like to thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, um, so, so, you know, um, I think the people who have helped us through this journey. They know who they are. And if they're listening to this podcast from the bottom of my heart, thank you for everything that you guys, you guys do on a daily basis for eBay. But for the, for the, for the sake of this conversation, I would like to um, thank a person who and recognize him for what he has done for me. He probably doesn't know this, um, what he, what the impact he has made. His name is Jonathan Paffrey. Jonathan Paffrey is the um, director of Climate Resolve and um, Cl Climate Resolve builds collaborations to champion equitable climate solutions. That's their mission. Uh, so uh, Jonathan uh, has helped us tremendously with so many different things, but I, one that I recall, there was um, when the movie Inconvenient Truth came out, he wrote an article. At that time, we were very new, we were probably a year or two years old. So in that article, he talked about certain people that um, just talk a really good talk, but when it comes to action, they fall short. And there are others who are doing the work, but they're not looking for any kind of credit. And he mentioned us, which twice surprised. It was oh, wow. We weren't, we weren't thinking, we, we didn't know that he was going to, I just accidentally bumped into his article. And when you're a first time entrepreneur with a new technology and you don't have the confidence what you're building and uh, this type of recognition from somebody, a veteran in this field is very important. So I would say having someone like him keep encouraging us to keep move forward made a huge impact. So. He was instrumental in our continued perseverance of the technology. And also in, he had introduced us to a lot of um, clean tech community. So I think he will be a great guest here. That's exciting. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, the Urban Complex gives a big note of thanks to today's guest, Clara Morakin, uh, CEO yeah. and co-founder of ePave. Thanks for joining us. It's been great. Yeah, this is great. Thank you. Thank you. I want to leave you with one quote because you guys yeah. were asking about how many people work for you and um, work with this team. And I remember that I was reading this uh, quote from Margaret Mead and I have uh, kept that for a long time. But recently when I was working on the pitch deck, I decided to put that on the vision. So we put the, our vision is and then underneath I wrote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever helped, ever has. Love so. Love That's it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, that. With that, <laughs> mic drop. Mike, Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. That was Thank fun. You. you bet. <laughs> Support for this episode of The Urban Complex comes from MST. MST is a Salesforce certified integrator. We work on building customer experience solutions, and deploy them for our customers. As we started evolving, our why also continued to evolve as a company. Over the last three years, uh, the whole approach was really revolving around what we call three C's, which is customers, colleagues, and community. All right, Dom, that was Claire of ePave. What'd you think? 
Wow. She's awesome. I mean, what a great story and what a great product. I mean, this is just kind of what gets me really excited about the smart cities space. I mean, it's one, it's so broad and you've got entrepreneurs like Clara, you know, developing innovative technologies and products that could really alter our urban environment. I mean, think about the challenges that we have even just here in Phoenix, Arizona with urban heat islands and oh, yeah. you know, how hot the pavement gets. And here's a company that's working to solve that challenge on behalf yeah, of- Yeah, I mean, if you can get a coating that can actually preserve what's already been there, right? So you don't have to rip it up or don't let it go. And if they can figure out, I mean, it's kind of tough to not be reflective as a color black. That's just the nature of its property. But if you can figure out how to be reflective there and preserve and, you know, it's a game changer. And it's, well, just, it's just cool to see how they're approaching this. Um, I was going to give her a little hard time. She was talking about uh, smart cities mean fresh air and knowing they live in L.A., but she even called the spade a spade. So <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, she, they get to work on it. So totally. I mean, she's great. I, you know, I have really high hopes for ePave and the company and what they could potentially do. I mean, that's it's one of the biggest expenses is, you know, asphalt and pavement and, you know, street repairs for cities. And so if they can help start to really transform that piece of the the pie for for cities who knows what what else could happen and, and you know what was really cool is like hearing her rattle off those agencies she's worked with i mean how many times have we heard a group talk about how instrumental one of those groups are to get them started but she worked like 10 of them like three different Always. accelerators they all got her product market fit some of those uh civic groups that open up doors and miss pallies and the parking groups that own the parking she even had nsf that helped to fund the research so they're just Always. very scrappy and uh you know, they, they said 12 projects, beta testing, 200,000 square foot. I, I, we, we, we both have been entrepreneurs. We know how hard it is to get the things moving and how it takes tough to get it out of there. But, you know, they, they definitely know what they're doing. They know they know kind of the fix. They can put it in the economic, the environmental and the human impact. And totally. this seems like it's in a great spot to, to do some serious change. Yeah, she definitely has passion for her product and what they're doing. And so I'm sure they're going to be successful. And I look forward to helping connect uh, and potentially helping them find some products or projects, uh, maybe here in Arizona. Who knows? Yeah. I, I She did mention that uh, when you know we, we turned off the recording that they're doing some stuff in Africa and Germany. So it's good to see them. Getting and even in their backyard the in Glendale, California. So yeah, yeah they're just clearly, clearly all over. So this is great. Uh, so what about cracks in the pavement today? What do you have for us? Yeah, you know it's interesting. We we we're talking about this, you know, in the in, in the face of what we just heard from uh, from Clara. But this one's called Louisville I, excuse me, Louisville I's forming public electric utility to meet climate goals. Now, I don't know how often this happens, but you know, I haven't I haven't heard of a new utility forming. Uh, so it's pretty exciting. So it's goal of 100% clean energy. They want to uh, figure out how to you know bring this municipality to bring electricity to buildings in a bid to meet its climate goals just seems like they're really taking their own matters in their own hands. Sounds exciting. Yeah. I mean, it's really exciting. It kind of falls right in line with, you know, Amy from Envision Charlotte and everything they, they were doing. Um, you know, you're exactly right. Cities are saying, well, if the utility is not going to do it, we'll, we're going to have to do it for ourselves. Um, so it'll be really interesting. And, you know, there are challenges when you, anytime you kind of municipalize uh, a service like this with costs and scale, but, um, I think it will be a great test example for maybe other cities around the country that uh, might have some similar ideas. And you know what? I, as I read lower in, it says, "Wow!" According to an energy dashboard for the metro area of Louisville, their their, their local provider gets sixty percent of its power from coal, thirty seven percent from natural gas, three percent from hydroelectric, and only one one less than one tenth from solar. So clearly, a different market than us in Arizona. But you can tell this is probably a way to wake the, wake up their their provider. Maybe it maybe it gets them competitive and and changes the game for for their city. Yeah, it's going to be a really exciting experiment to watch. It's going to be a good one. Right on. All right. Well, thanks all for joining. Uh, we know we've cut down the the just to, to about two a month, but a lot going on for us. But uh, it's been great, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Yep, all. you got it. See you, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Urban Complex: Smarter Cities for a Stronger Tomorrow. Please find us on where you listen, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. We do love your feedback. Let us know if you have ideas for guests or questions to air on Cracks in the Pavement via social media. The Urban Complex is found on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Or just shoot me an email, chris at theurbancomplex.com. Until next time.